in Matthew 19, a passage that if you've been with us through the Gospel of Mark, Mark records for us as well. But real briefly, in just a few verses in Matthew 19, we have this recorded for us. It says, Then children were brought to him that he may lay hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be here in your house in this place, to be here with you. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would open our hearts and our minds, that our spirits would be lifted by your presence, that we would hear from you this morning, that we would take on the instruction of your word and the principles it points to us, especially in regard to our children and leading them to Christ and the example that is set and the, the heritage that they receive of faith, how great that is that we can instruct our children in your ways and lead them to you. Lord, I ask that the Spirit would speak this morning, not my words, but His, that we would be drawn to you. In Jesus' name, amen. As parents, we generally, or at least I sure hope so, want what's best for our children, or at least if you're a good parent, you want what's best for your child. But unfortunately, that, that idea of, of giving our children what's best for them can be somewhat subjective depending from, from parent to parent and person to person, even within the context of a single family, there may be a different idea of what that means. There can be ideas that, that direct our priorities and influences that direct our priorities. They can be based off of the way that we were raised, because obviously we as an individual were raised better than the person we're raising our children with. All of our kids' problems are their problems, right? Amen? Someone in the back said amen. But, but sometimes it, it extends just beyond your own way that you were raised or what you were familiar with or what you grow up with. It can extend to the culture that we live in. The culture can have an influence on what it means to be a good parent or give your child a, a good childhood or, or whatever that may look like. And usually when we bring up the context of culture, we think of the, the broader popular culture, the culture we see in the populace on the coasts on either end of our nation. But even we have a culture that influences what we think a good child rearing looks like. There, there's all sorts of, of ideas and influences. Some people have their own philosophies guided by the people that they follow or the people that they look up to. But either way, if you ask 30 sets of parents what's a way to, to raise your child the best way possible, you're going to get 60 different answers from those 30 sets of parents. It, it can be a difficult and daunting thing just even understanding that I'm responsible for another human being. When we had our, our first son, it didn't really fully hit me and impact me until I got to hold him. And then all of a sudden, this giant weight crashed down upon me. And I went, I have to keep this human being alive. How do I do that? What is the best way to do this? How do I train this child that is my child that I'm responsible for, that God has gifted me? How do I train them in the way that is a good way? And of course, everyone who trains their child within their own certain way believes that it is the good way. But I would like to propose that the good way, if we're going by a strict understanding of what good even is, is the biblical way of raising our children. And it's impossible as human beings to, to take out any portion of, of culture or our own influences or philosophies or ideas that we bring into it. But it is especially important because of that, that we gird and guard our understanding of how it is that I raise a child in accordance with the parameters that the scriptures set out for us. Now today we're going to look at a, a couple of different examples of, of the weight and the gravity that we would feel and should feel as parents as well as the, the weight that we should feel as, as people who are choosing to honor and follow God and what that looks like now that I have a child who also I want to honor and follow God. In 1 Samuel, at the very beginning of it, we have our first example I want to look at. Now, these examples are, are primarily focused not on the child itself and not even really on practical child-rearing tips, but on the, the heart of the individual who's doing this practice, this very thing that we want to continue and do to walk within the will of God and also raise a child in the good way, to give them a good raising. 1 Samuel chapter 1, we open with the story of Hannah who gives birth to Samuel. 
But when we open this story in verse 3, we're not at that point yet. We're still focusing here on Hannah. And this is truly the focus of this part of the story in verse 3 of 1 Samuel 1. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to, to Phinehas, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went, by, it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? There's two primary details that were given about Hannah in this introduction to this immensely important book in the history of Israel. Without uh, uh, Samuel, we don't have the story of Samuel and, and his anointing of Saul and the collapse of that kingdom and the anointing of David. We start the story of King David all the way back with the prophet who anoints him. And we see the mother of the prophet who anoints him. And her introduction into the story is simply that the Lord has closed her womb. That her, her, her husband, though, though kind and compassionate, who does love her, exceedingly loves her. He gives her a double portion when they go up to sacrifice at Shiloh. But this isn't a, a fix for the issue that, that Hannah has. She's still grieving over the fact that I cannot produce a child, that the Lord has closed my womb. That this is not going to, to happen to me. And this is within the cultural context of a time, even though we're speaking of, of righteous people. These people go up and they make sacrifice. These are, are good people. But even in this cultural context, so much of the value that was placed in one's wife was the fact that one's wife produced children for them. And so we have this wife who is greatly loved by her husband, but especially in the cultural world that she lives in, has less value to her husband, even though he isn't projecting that on her. But the world around her says, you have less value to your husband. Your womb is closed. And even the other wife that she has to deal with continually pesters her over this issue continually beats her down over the fact that she cannot produce a child for her husband. But despite of the, the cultural capital being low for, for barren women, her husband does love her and favors her more so. So we have this setup. Now continue down in verse 9. After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. There, there's something in this story that nowadays may not seem as significant or important to our understanding of what's going on, but, but it's right there in, in verse 11, and she vowed a vow. Nowadays, the idea of vowing a, a vow or dedicating oneself to, to something has become almost meaningless. To, to, to swear oneself by something or to promise of something in, in a world that doesn't even understand what truth is and the truth is subjective and your truth is different than my truth, but they're both true, doesn't understand the, the, the harshness and severity of I'm vowing something to you. In almost every context, a vow has, in our culture, even in our culture, has lost meaning. The, the, the vows of, of marriage or promises made or, or business deals where handshakes used to be a valid thing of, I know this thing will come to pass, I know it will happen, no longer mean anything. But during this particular time, and especially with the law of Moses and the serious emphasis that it places on making a vow. And these people are righteous people. They want to do right by the Lord. What, what Hannah is doing here in making this vow is making a promise that absolutely cannot be undone. And in the midst of her grief, as she asks the Lord for a child, as she is focusing on, I want a child, Lord, she instead redirects her personal desire to the Lord's direction. 
Lord, if you will give me a son, I will give him to you. Well, why wouldn't she just ask for the son? Wouldn't that be better? She wants a son. That's the problem. That's the issue. But in this vow that she makes, she not only understands her own grief and her misery, that she wants a child. She wants to give her husband a child. She wants to have a child. She doesn't want the weight and the pressure of, of the stigma of this woman whose womb's closed around her. All of these things. But even in the midst of this, Hannah, who is a righteous individual, understands what's better than me receiving a child, what's better than God giving me the gift of a child, is that I would give that child to the Lord. That He actually receives that child. And I vow this vow, if you indeed look on me, if you look upon my affliction, on my suffering, I'm not going to keep the thing that's going to ease the affliction and suffering, but I'm going to return it to the Lord. It's not solely going to be mine, but it will be the Lord's. If we go down in the story, Hannah does have a child. Go to verse 24 of 1 Samuel 1. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who, has stand, who was standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. there there's a little bit different social structure when it comes to, to weaning. When we think of a child being weaned, we think of a much younger child than what have, would have been here. He certainly would have been able to eat for himself and walk and do those things, but he is still a young child. They have not had a great amount of time to be together. She has made a vow and a promise, and after the point that he is weaned, after the point he is not dependent for life upon his mother, she carries through with that vow. And she goes to Shiloh and she stands before the Lord and she says, I'm lending you to him for the rest of his life. He is yours to do as you please, Lord. And she leaves Shiloh without the child that she begged and pled with for a very long time. Now, I, I made sure to point out beforehand that this is not some sort of a practical tips for raising children. Do not leave your weaned children at the church, please. But understanding the, the, the impact and meaning of her words and of her vow is what I think practically applies to us today. Especially if you are someone who can identify with Hannah's plea of not being able to have a child and finally receiving that, the longing that's there. And her vow is, Lord, he will be yours. And Hannah carries through on her vow and she leaves her child with the Lord. That child completely belongs to the Lord. When we think about the way that we raise our children, we instill certain values, certain philosophies, even ways of problem solving. I know some of the, the, the young people that I've been on trips with, especially if their parents are gone, you see this more emphasized, or, or I see that their thought process or the way that they speak sounds just like their parents, sometimes to their own detriment. And I see that parent in that child. It's a way we don't even think about. I don't even think about the common phrases I use until I hear maybe one of my kids say those phrases. I'm like, oh boy, I say that a lot, don't I? Right? Usually it's not positive phrases they start repeating. Right? But when we think about dedicating our child to the Lord, as Hannah said, I vow this vow, this child is yours. I believe in a Christian household. If we want what is best for our kid, and if we understand the, the best thing for our child is God himself, the, the idea of this practice that my child is not just my child. He is a gift from the Lord. He's been granted to me. Maybe I've been yearning and longing as Hannah has to finally have this child but coming to the point of realization in the way that we raise this child, this child is not raised to be an exact copy of me and my priorities and my goals and my understandings in life, but this is the Lord's child. When we dedicate our, our children, it's not just a, a fun time to see a bunch of babies on stage. It's a time of great gravity as we vow a vow before the Lord 
that this child that you have given me is yours to the day of his death. That my role as the godly parent is not simply to make a copy of me and my opinions and my political ideologies and all of these things, but as I will steward this life that is truly yours, Lord. That even though it is my child, that I will raise it in such a way that it knows you, that it follows you, that I am eliminated from those ideas and understandings, and you alone are the raiser of my child because they are yours, God. That's the vow of, of dedication. That's the vow that Hannah has before her child is even conceived within her. She vows that this is the Lord's child. And I would hope that that would be our, our longing and our intention. Yes, we will not follow through in the most perfect of ways at times. Yes, they will repeat things and make sure, yeah, I'm not following through in perfect ways at times. But the, the solidified understanding that this is not my child in the truest sense That if I've been redeemed of Christ and he's given me the gift of this child, this child is God's child. He's the one he will be following. There's elements of of Hannah's story as well that we see echoed further on in Sarah and Abraham. Excuse me, further on the backwards, rewinded. So Sarah is also a barren woman. Sarah is also in a rivalry with the maidservant that she gave to Abraham to conceive a child because God wasn't acting in her sort of time frame. And in fact, there's many examples that we could spend a long time discussing here today about the, the concept of the barren woman, the one who cannot conceive, the one who cannot give birth, and how God miraculously produces a child in a way that no man could have brought about or produced. It's not some sort of guarantee that that happens, but it is an example of the way that God comes through in ways that, that we couldn't even thought of or, or understand. But in Genesis chapter 22, there's another point I want us to see. If we see Hannah and we see that she is, in a sense, giving a living sacrifice of her child over to God, there's a specific literal sacrifice that's being given as well. In Genesis 22, starting there in verse 1, After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he replied, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will show you later. Whereas we have Hannah in this first story longing and begging and asking for a child. We have Abraham and Sarah who are promised that a people, that a nation, that a multitude more than the stars of the sky or the sand of the seas are going to be given to them through an offspring. And they receive that offspring. We have Isaac born to them. And then we have the same God who kept his promises and has delivered this child to him. Wake up Abraham in the night and say, Abraham, that one and only child, he even kind of makes sure he understands the gravity, that one and only child, I want you to go to this mountain and sacrifice him as a burnt offering before me. Again, these are general precepts, not mandates. We already have a sacrifice. That's another beautiful part of the story that's here with Abraham. And we would sometimes, as parents especially, we may think of, well, what kind of response would I have if God had said something like this to me? Well, wouldn't a good parent ignore this type of a thing? Wouldn't a good parent say, no, I'm going to protect my child from all things, especially death, at all costs? But what Abraham does is what a good parent does. Abraham listens to the Lord. Even though there's a heavy price and even there's an understanding as we see as Scripture, it it, it unfolds later on where Abraham understood that God could even raise his son for the dead. He believed in the promises of God over and above the, the circumstance that he was now in. God had promised him that he would be a father of many people and many nations, numerous as the stars, yet he has only one son. And now God has said, give me that son. And he says, I will. If you look at the third verse of chapter 22, we see his response. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkeys, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place which God had told him. Abraham understood exactly what was going to be happening. He understood specifically two things, that God had given him a son and God now demanded of him his son. 
And we may say, as I hope we do, God would not ask us to, to do this, to literally sacrifice my child on a burnt offering. Yes and amen. He is not asking you to do that. But he is absolutely asking for the sacrifice of your children. Not in the sense of a, a literal death, but in the same sense he asks us in Romans 12 that we would be a living sacrifice. If we want to raise our children well in accordance with what God has called us to do, in accordance with the, the context of community of faith that we're called to live and walk in, we not only need to be a living sacrifice in our own sanctification, in our own growth in the Lord, but we need to teach our children what it looks like to be a living sacrifice. That we don't look like the rest of the culture. That we don't have a, a mindset like the rest of the culture. Because we're a people who are called by God and redeemed of God to live differently. Because of what Christ has done for me, I will sacrifice the desires of my flesh, the, the things that I personally want to pursue. Why would we not then, if we're trying to raise our children in the way of the Lord, instruct them in the same purpose? Or maybe there, there are goals and, and dreams that we have for our kids long before they can even dream dreams. But is that my child or is it the Lord's child? Am I training them to repeat me and follow in my fallible footsteps? Or am I training them that I should give up all things no matter what it looks like or, or what desire I may have for the cause of Jesus Christ instead? Now, as a quick reminder, we're in a Baptist church here. We understand that the church is those who have come to Christ. We, we have no illusions that our, our children are redeemed or, or specially saved in, in the, any sort of way before they come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Their church membership doesn't save them or, or any of those, those things that have been contrived that we don't see in the scriptures. Nonetheless, we're told to instruct the children in the way that they should go. We're instructed that we should teach the things of the Lord to our children. And it's interesting when you see passages like that as you stand up, as you sit down, as you lie down, and instruct them in the way of the Lord. Well, well that's in all things. That's, we've covered all of the categories, every position, standing, sitting, lying. In all things, even though our children may not yet be redeemed, we have a confidence and an understanding that the Word of God does not return void, that the Holy Spirit is powerful, that the Word is powerful as a double-edged sword. And if we truly believe in the promises of God that this instruction is for you and for your children, we're going to train our children. We're going to instruct our children. Understanding in if you have children, you are acutely aware. Children are sinners too. They need to be taught and shown, and I'm going to put an emphasis on shown. In the same way, if I tell my children that my wife is, is, is the, the single person on this earth who is my greatest priority, that, that I love her with every ability that I have, but I spend absolutely no time with her, give no concern for the things of her, what do they really see about the way I love my wife? There's a lot of lip service that's paid in our culture. There's a Christian subculture that exists where we do the, the church stuff when it's convenient. We, we, we want to make sure that they know who Jesus is, but as soon as we, usually when the car door closes on the way out, we forget who Jesus is. Well, one of the, the, from the research that, that's been done specifically for, for my generation and understanding some of the things that have happened, one of the reasons why people leave the church outside of the fact that they're, they're not redeemed and they don't know Christ is that it's imaginary. We sing the pretty songs and we, we, we do all of the handshakes and happy faces and all of this on Sunday morning and, and, and Wednesdays or whatever it may be that people choose to finally come. We do all of these things, but as soon as I get home, I never hear the name of Christ. I never see the Bible lived out. There's no concept of forgiveness or grace or mercy that's practiced in my home. It's make-believe. If Jesus is the, the Savior of my parent, why don't I see that at home? Why don't I see that reflected in the way that, that, that they choose to lead our family and live our life and dictate the schedule and all of these things? If Jesus is the most important and greatest priority, if Christ's kingdom is the thing that I'm looking forward to, it's the greatest thing that could ever be conceived. That's the longing. That's what they say. That's what they sing. It must be imaginary because it's never seen or sang or spoken or practiced outside of that building. 
It's just a fancy masquerade ball that we go to on Sunday mornings. You will instruct your children when you rise, when you sit down, and when you lie. The instruction of our children is more than just here. Yes, here is important. Here is the community of faith. Be, being an, assembled together is a literal command of God that when we ignore is what we call sin. But it extends out. It needs to be real. Authentic. Otherwise, we might as well instruct our kids in the way of Cinderella or Snow White because it's just as real to them when they don't see it at home. What does it mean then when we say we want to dedicate our children to the Lord, to model a sacrifice, to, to model this priority of my child is God's. I've been chosen by God for some reason to be responsible for these living, breathing creatures that I must instruct. But if I understand who God is and that everything is truly the Lord's and that includes my children, what does it mean when I come and say I'm dedicating my child to the Lord? Because it begs the question, well, what is it then? What, what is this vow of Hannah? What is this sacrifice, this willingness of Abraham? It, the dedication of our children, it's, it's not the, the sacramental sense like we have with the Lord's Supper or, or the ordinance of, of baptism. This is not something that we see as a, a commanded thing that the church does when it comes together. But we most certainly see in the scriptures that children are treated as special that children are dedicated and given over to the Lord by their righteous parents. By parents who understand that it is not them who should be raising their kids. Left alone to my own sinful flesh, my kids are doomed. But when my kids are handed over to Christ by what I practice at home, by what we read at home, what we sing at home, what we say at home, that's a child who's been dedicated to the Lord. Not a child who's become a slave to activity with a little Jesus thrown in on the weekend. Dedicating a child to the Lord is a serious business. When we vow a vow before God, it's not a flippant thing. A vow that is vowed before the face of God carries more weight than any other vow, including your marriage vows that you'll ever have in your entire life, which is also a vow before God. We dedicate our children to the Lord because of the example of faithful saints who have gone before us and done the same. Many faithful saints even who didn't have to have a fun ceremony where we stand up on the stage with our kids. That's cool and all. Everyone loves it. They get to see your kids. It makes it a little special, but it's a marker and a signpost, similar to the way last week when we had the Lord's Supper. This is a, a signpost in the ground that on a routine basis we get to stop and participate in the divine meal of Christ to, to drink of the blood and eat of the flesh that He's provided for our redemption. And here we have a, a signpost in the same sense of, I must raise this child who at times it would be much easier to raise him for Satan than it would be to raise him for the Lord. But I've made vows before God and before my community of faith that this child is dedicated to Christ. No matter how I feel about it in the moment, even, and especially when grace is difficult and in shorthand, that usually coincides with the amount of patience we have too. That this child is the Lord's child. Our dedication to the Lord does not mean that we, we, we turn to the Bible when we are in need because of trouble that we are having as parents or that kids are in crisis. It doesn't mean that we drop the kids off when it fits our family schedule, hoping that they'll learn how to not be mean to mommy and daddy when they get home. It doesn't mean any other categorical thing that we could conceive of as behavioral change. Or we're doing this to make sure my kid's not a little devil. What it does mean, instead of turning to the Bible in crisis, is that my kids will know the God of the Bible. That my kids will know what Christ has done. Not merely because of what occurs at the community of faith and the discipleship that happens there, but it will be spoken when we rise, when we sit, and when we lay down. That it won't be a fairy tale that we conceive of on weekends. It will be a pattern of life that's lived in the family. A lot has been said about, well, the way that people are raised. Usually it's in the context of bad behavior that we say that. You weren't raised this way. Or, well, you know how those kids were raised. If you've never heard that one, it's because it's your kids. 
And I think there's a great deal to that. We can play the psychological game of, of nature versus nurture. Are, are we just bad on the outright or, or are people raised that way? Well, the Bible fixes that really clear. I'll repeat it again. They're vipers and diapers. They're fallen in a sin nature. I'll give you the answer. They don't know Christ. That sweet baby doesn't know Jesus. Your, your toddler, well, I don't need to cover that one. Your teenager, no, I don't need to cover that one either. They don't know Jesus. And, and while we are so blessed to have so many young people who do come to this church that we're able to speak Christ into, there, there's nothing that I could do from this pulpit that will make more of a difference in your kid's life than if you live like you know Jesus. Then if you practice grace and mercy, if you speak the scripture, if you worship as a family, is the, the community of faith important? Absolutely. Because sometimes your kids don't need you to speak into them. They need someone else. We're hurting ourselves if we're not in the community. But even more than that, you, the parent of that child, they need you to show them who Jesus is in a way that I can't, in a way that the Sunday school teacher can't. And in the reverse, when there's times that you can't, they can. Raising a child and, and dedicating them towards the Lord is that they would know who God is. That we have a fellowship of the saints, that we share our spiritual gifts, that we build up the body of Christ. That it's not just about me, that it's not just about my priorities, about the things that I want or desire, but that I have been dedicated to God. That Christ is my priority, even before they know Him, that they know what is the expectation. That we follow Christ alone. I want to leave us with this passage that I love to point out every time that we have one of these. It's in Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. It's one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture for a multitude of reasons, but especially as a parent, there's been a new light that's been shined on it. It's very simple. It says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God. There are secret things that belong to Him. Things about the, the, the future that he has foreknowledge of that we can't know, conceive, or understand. Things about me and the, the issues that I deal with and the sins I must fight. Those secret things belong to the Lord. He knows why he's brought things about. But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children. Forever that we may do all the words of his law. Though there are things that we encounter as a parent that we don't understand. Sometimes our, our, our kids get sick in a way that, that we couldn't have conceived of or imagined. Things, things happen to us that is not the perfect white picket fence picture that we think of as, as being a parent, of what it looks like, or even as a godly parent, because I will fail and I will sin and I will let my children down. The, the secret things belong to the Lord. We, we can philosophize all day long and come right back to where we're at when we say, I don't know. But God has given us something, a beautiful gift that he's given us to instruct our children in the Lord, and that's the revealed things. I don't know under understand why, why kids get sick, why, why kids rebel, or any of those things. I have no clue why that happens. It's a secret thing. But what I do know is I should raise a child in the way they should go. I know that I should instruct my children in who this God is, that He's revealed Himself to me when I don't deserve to have it. The revealed things are for you and your children, that they would know that God. We're going to have a time of, of dedication now. Uh, I did a test to see if you'd actually pick up a bulletin today because you're going to need one on the back end of your prayer sheet. Uh, if you have children in the nursery, if you want to go ahead and grab those. Uh, if you have your children here with us, if you want to go ahead and come up here, uh, we're going to have our dedication ceremony for you guys. We preached first, and now all the babies are asleep. You're welcome. Just up here, anywhere you want to be. I'll tell you where to stand. Wherever grandparents can get better pictures.
our children dedication, if, if you're here this morning with a child that you'd like to dedicate to the Lord, you have that opportunity to do so. This is not a, well, I had to get with David first sort of a thing. If you understand the weight of the vow that's being explained here, if you understand the gravity of a vow before God, you're welcome to come up here. Hurry up, Angela, we're almost done. Oh, okay. What we are doing here today, do we have everybody that we know of? We're good? All right. What we're doing here today is to pray over these children and these parents. The act of dedicating a child to the Lord is so much more an act on behalf of the parent than it is on the child. Uh, because we already know the child is a sinful creature. It will rebel and it is up to the parent to show them the grace, mercy, and sometimes the wrath of the Lord. But I'm going to have our, our congregation, our community of faith, who is also responsible for the discipleship of the children of our church to participate with us. If you have your bulletin, you've got the insert with the uh, dedication promises that we'll be having. We're going to commit to be praying for the children and for their parents. That first and foremost, that they would know the Lord as their master, that they would be dedicated to faithfully serving him all the days of their life. That just as Hannah gave her child over to the Lord, that we as parents would be willing to give our child over to the Lord. That we would raise them solely in the Lord's instruction. That, that I would ignore the, the fallible part of me and raise them in Christ. Along with these lives of parents and kids, I want the congregation to know the, the weight of the responsibility as they too will make a promise to these parents and to these kids. To help raise them in the way of the Lord, to be a support system when it's needed. The families here are standing here today recognize the importance of a vow before the Lord and recognize the importance of needing to raise their child in the Lord in a promise and a sacrifice. Parents, if uh, you would repeat after me as we make our, our parent promise before the congregation and before the Lord is our vow to dedicate our child. I recognize that this child is a gift from God. And I accept the joyful responsibility of training them in the ways of righteousness alongside the fellowship of the saints with Christ as my foundation the scriptures as my instruction Holiness as my standard, with the grace and loving kindness of my God, in every word, thought, and deed. Congregation, would you please stand to repeat after me as you make a promise before God and to these parents here. If you'll repeat after me, we recognize this family as a gift from God. And we accept the joyful responsibility of walking alongside them in the love of Christ, bearing their burdens, celebrating their highs, and weeping with them in their lows. With Christ as our foundation, the scriptures as our instruction, Holiness as our standard, with the grace and loving kindness of our God, in every word, thought, and deed, 
as we sojourn together as a community of faith. I want to pray for our parents specifically. I've got three prayers that I want us to pray. If you'll pray along with me for those that you know up here or those that you don't know that you need to get to know. But pray with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today in thanksgiving and praise. Your design for the family and the beautiful way that you've given us these gifts uh, cause us to stand in awe of your, your mercy and your grace towards us. We thank you for choosing these people to come before us today with their children that you've given them. We ask that you would give them a blessing of peace as they pursue the, the biblical role of parenthood as you've given them. We ask that you would be with them in the midst of the, the joy and of the difficulty that they would understand and walk in the responsibility of training these children that you've placed in their care that we would never forget as parents that our first job is to point them to you. That before they're even kids, they're the souls that you've given us to train in the word and in your holiness that we would reflect the grace and mercy that our Heavenly Father gives to us towards them, that we would lead them to the cross and show them who you are. Lord, we, we ask for supernatural strength for these parents, that your spirit would f help them to fulfill the role that you've called them to. In Jesus' name, amen. As the congregation also plays a role in being raised in the way of the Lord, I want to have a prayer for our congregants. If our parents would pray along with me in the role that you'll also be playing in the raising of these children. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you as the, the people of this church. We ask that you would enable and equip us to help these parents as they're trying to show their kids who Christ is that we would fulfill the role of the family of God, that we would step in in ways that were needed, that we wouldn't be concerned with bothering, but that we would ask that we would pursue relationship with these parents, that we would be able to be with them and help them in any way that we can. Even if it means a, being sacrificial, having to give up my own things or wants or comforts in order to help raise a child in, in, in the instruction of the Lord, that you would give us those opportunities and that we would be faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Lastly, I want us to together pray for these children, for the Im immense responsibility that we've prayed for the parents and for the congregation, but also for these children specifically, that we would pray for the desire that they would know Christ. If you'll pray with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, as we're so blessed to approach your throne of grace this morning, Lord, I humbly plea on behalf of these young children. I ask that you would give them through the power of your spirit, new eyes to see you. Lord, I ask that you would help us as we're given such a, an enormous responsibility as followers of Christ, not just to take the light out into the world to show other people who you are, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, but Lord, you, you've given us an even heavier responsibility that I must train my children who you are. Lord, we are so desperately dependent on you for that. Lord, I will fail and I will sin and I will even sin against my children at times. But Lord, help me to show them the, the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. Help me to, to be repentant before them when that happens. Help them to see those things. Help them to see your word proclaimed in the household. To see the priority of Christ and his bride in their lives. Lord, help them to understand who you are. We ask for, for their salvation, but Lord, we also ask for their health and their development, that they would continue to grow physically in a healthy way, in a way that you would guard them in that, Lord. God, as we are coming to a, a close today of this dedication, I ask that you would be with us as the people of God here in this place, that this would be a signpost and a reminder, not just of the, the joy and the wonder of children and, and raising children, but also the bond of love of what you've called the community of faith to look like. That we are not just metaphorical brothers and sisters, but we are something even greater. We're a spiritual family. That we're brothers and sisters through the blood of Jesus, something that will never, never go away, something that will last for all eternity. The blood of Christ is what brings us together. Help us to remember that. Help us to have a bond of love that the world sees and understands that that is something different. We would have a love for one another's children. The world would see that's something different. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all want to be seated.
As we come to the close of today's Lord's Day service, I also want to offer an opportunity for others. The Lord speaks in mysterious and powerful ways, and I wouldn't want to neglect an opportunity to give anyone to come to, to, to surrender themselves to Christ or to come in their need of prayer or are needing and follow up in baptism after coming to the Lord. So we'll close with that opportunity during our benediction. If you need me, I'll be here at the front just like we normally do. Uh, but we'll have a, a hymn that we sing together and then we'll close and have announcements. But pray with me, please, as we enter this time. Dear Heavenly Father, you are a good God far beyond our comprehension. Lord, it is beautiful to see the instruction and the wisdom of your word. Lord, it also is painful because it confronts us in our own sinfulness. It confronts our selfish desires. It confronts all the things that we think we need and we think we want, or even what we think our children need or want. Lord, I ask that you would redirect our hearts towards you, that you would soften us towards your word and your instruction, that we would be drawn to you and your goodness and your loving kindness, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.